on relationship. He is known as the relationship guru. And he has a couple of books. One he wrote with his wife called The Conscious Heart. And the latest one, which he just brought out, which is called The Big Leap. And one thing that I liked about his bio that he said, he's going to talk about this in his talk. When we make the big leap into the zone of genius, the harmful part of the ego disappears and fear dissolves. Wow, that is very profound. Okay, Gay Hendrix, it's all yours. Well, hello, thank you. Thank you for inviting me down. I drove down from Ojai today. My day started out at the dentist early this morning because I'd uh, chipped a little piece of tooth. And uh, so my day is obviously looking up to be finishing down here after that uh, beginning. Um, I've uh, been here before. We've all been here before, but uh, I've, uh, I've uh, spoken, had the honor and privilege of speaking to your group before. And one thing I really um, always enjoyed when I've come down here is the great questions that people ask. And so I've left a little bit of extra time at the end of tonight's uh, conversation to uh, have plenty of Q&A. So uh, polish up your best question. I'm always interested in that part of things because then I don't know what people are, you know, don't know what's going to come at me. Um, I, my journey that brings me here tonight actually started off with a literal bang. When I was 24 years old, I had never heard of yoga, I'd never heard of psychotherapy, I'd never heard of medita anything like the stuff that we talk about and are part of our lives today. I'd grown up down in central Florida, out in the woods and the swamps of central Florida, and um, I kind of took a fix on being a, an English, a, a, a novelist, basically, and an English teacher. And that was kind of the direction I was going in. When I was 24 years old, um, I weighed 320 pounds. I was smoking about two or three packs of Marlboros a day. I was um, in a job I didn't like, and I was in a relationship that was a very painful, troubled relationship that I'd been in for a couple of years, but I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And so just about everything that could be going wrong in my life was going wrong. And um, I went out for a walk. It was a January uh, afternoon, and I went out for a walk. It had snowed the night before. This was up in New Hampshire, where I was a teacher and counselor then at a school for delinquent boys. And um, it was the first job I could get out of um, college. Um, and so um, I went out for a walk to kind of clear my head, because... Um, my um, then wife and I had had an argument and I was sort of scrambled and so I went out for a walk and it had snowed the night before and the snow had covered a patch of ice and as I was walking along sort of lost in my thoughts I stepped on that patch of ice and my feet shot out from under me and the back of my head smacked on the road and uh, actually I still have the knot back there from it so it's a living reminder um, I've written about it in a couple of books and so on a number of occasions I've had the exotic experience of having people come up to me in an airport and ask me to feel my knot and because uh, they uh, I mentioned that I still have it so um, I um, I slipped and smacked my back of my head such that I didn't quite knock myself all the way out but I was um, you know, you've heard of out-of-body experiences. I, what I call it was an out-of-Hendrix experience because for about two minutes, I was in this ultra-clear state of consciousness where I was not aware of my body. I had apparently knocked myself out enough to sort of paralyze my body for a moment. And um, in that state, I had this incredible ability to see down through all of the layers of myself. And I could see why my muscles were real tight, and I could see why I was overweight. I could see that I had these feelings inside me that I had never contacted, and because I hadn't contacted them, I was always stuffing myself to kind of keep my attention away from those. And um, so I, in that moment, I couldn't figure out what to do about it, though. 
And uh, I saw what the problem was, but I didn't know what the solution was because I began to come back to my regular state of consciousness. And it was as if I could feel my personality reassemble itself and my body kind of reassemble itself. And then I came back to full awareness and there I was on the road. But something in me made me say this one little thing as I was leaving that state behind. During that state, I had seen down through the center of myself to a place that was pure consciousness, where there was no programming on it, or it, it, was, it was impersonal, pure consciousness. And I realized in that moment that all of us have that within us, and it pervades the universe. And so it connects us all at that level of consciousness. And as I was coming back to the regular awareness of my body, I began to lose awareness of that state of consciousness. But I said this little thing to myself. I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes in my life to live in that state of pure consciousness with that awareness in me at every moment. And that was the last thing I said before I kind of woke up and there I was on the road shivering. And, and so I used that as a beacon and I... I went back and then a week or so later, I was in my house and a friend of mine came by and he said he was on his way down the road about 15 or 20 miles to an estate to hear one of his old Harvard professors give a talk. And he said that when he was, um, his Harvard professor had just come back from India and he'd had some kind of life change and he wanted to find out what was going on with him. And it turned out to be Ram Dass. And um, whom I had never heard of before. And um, so we went down to his father's estate. Ram Dass, father, was a very wealthy man and had a beautiful estate. And so we went in there, and there were all these devotees of Ram Dass kind of floating around in Indian saris and very diaphanous outfits and things. And they offered us some fruit. And I thought it was just the weirdest thing I had ever <laughs> seen in my life. But... It was something about it was fascinating too. And so Ram Dass gave a long talk, about three hours. And it just blew me away that anybody could talk for three hours without notes. And he would just stop occasionally and take a few deep breaths and then speak again. And um, <clears throat> at the end of this three hours, I went up to him and I said, I've never heard of any of this stuff before, but there's something about the way you're speaking about it that really is fascinating to me and I may never see you again, what would you recommend that I do? Just looking at me, what would you think I would do if I were going to change my life? And he thought for a minute, and he said, you should do some breathing exercises. And I said, what do you mean breathing exercises? And he said, well, in India they have breathing exercises and things that you might do to solve a certain problem. You, instead of thinking about it or doing therapy about it, you might do some breathing exercises with it or some guided imagery exercises. And so I said, well, where would I find something like that? And he said this very interesting thing. He said, just kind of pay attention. It'll come to you. Okay. So after this, I went to the grocery store to do some grocery shopping. And on my way out to pay, I was standing there with my cart, and I looked to my left, and there was a rack of paperback books. And one of them said, Yoga, Youth, and Reincarnation. And I picked it up. I remember it cost 95 cents. And I picked it up. This was in 1969, by the way. And I picked it up, <clears throat> and I was leafing through it, and basically, it was an entire book full of yoga, meditation, and breathing exercises. It was one of the first collections like that there ever was. Uh, it was written by a gentleman named Jess Stern. Anyway, so there I'd gone from my fall on the ice to meeting Ram Dass to finding this little book in just such a compressed period of time right after making that commitment that I made coming out of the falling on the ice experience, that commitment to do whatever I could to live in that state of pure consciousness. And it was as if things then guided me from place to place until I'm here tonight. And along the way, there were a number of big leaps that I want to tell you about, and then I want to also talk to you about the, the genius material that's in the big leap. Um, so... I would say my first big leap of my life came with a big thud um, on the ice. I, over the next bunch of years, I really struggled with what had made that relationship I was in that I eventually got out of, 
what, what was it that had made it so difficult and painful? Because it was maybe two or three of the most painful years of my life. And I realized after a lot of thinking about it and a lot of staying single for a bunch of years, kind of mulling all of this over, I realized that in relationship, I or the other person always did three things that messed things up. And one of them was not to talk openly about the feelings we were having, whether it was anger or sadness or fear or sexual attraction to someone else or whatever the feeling was, when we didn't speak honestly about it, then we started criticizing each other. See, because if you're not speaking something truthfully in here, other people out there start to look different. And I'm sure you've seen that a million times in your relationships. And so I said to myself, well, what I'm going to have to do is be honest in every relationship situation I'm in, and that'll prevent a good many of the problems. The second thing I observed was that I messed up relationships any time I blamed the other person. And because, as you've probably noticed in life, when you blame another person, they don't usually just stand there and say, you know, you're right. I am responsible for all your misery. You know, uh, they usually aim it back at you and uh, say, uh, no, wait a minute, it's your fault. And then you go around and around because all arguments between couples are a race to occupy the victim position. And one person <laughs> is jumping into the victim position and says, I'm the victim. And then the other person pushes you out of the way and says, no, I'm the bigger victim here. And it goes around like that for 30 or 40 years and then you die. Um, <clears throat> so um, that was the second thing I realized, okay, when I'm dishonest, I start criticizing the other person and blaming the other person when what I really ought to be doing is just being honest about whatever I'm feeling. And blame causes a toxic reaction every time. So what's the alternative to blame? This took me about three years to figure this out. I can, I can say it now in 30 seconds, but I realized the only alternative to blame is to claim 100% responsibility for whatever it is, but in a gentle, loving way, not a blameful way, but simply say, hmm, why am I creating this experience? Of all the possible experiences I could be creating, why am I creating this one? So to kind of open up an inquiry into taking 100% responsibility. I made a third observation, which was that any time I wasn't fully committed to my own creative development, I would find fault in the relationship. And the other person I would be in relationship, whenever they weren't feeling creatively fulfilled, they would find fault with the relationship. So I saw this one-to-one -one correlation between how committed I am to my creative unfolding and how well my relationships go. And so I came up with this conclusion. I was in a relationship with a woman named Carol at the time, and I figured out all this. And um, we'd been sort of on and off for several years. And um, I remember the day I told her excitedly about this idea, because I just figured this out one day sitting back in my um, apartment. And um, so I went to explain it to Carol. And I said, Carol, here's the reason we always fight. One or the other of us doesn't tell the truth to each other. And then we blame the other person. And, or one of us starts blaming, and the other one blames back. And we get into a big argument about who's right and who's wrong. And the third thing, if we're not fully open up to and expressing our creative potential, we're always going to be chipping away at each other. That's what people do if they're not feeling creatively fulfilled. They feel they uh, find fault with something out here. And so I, you know, I thought this was the greatest idea I'd ever had. And I asked her, well, do you want to reformulate our relationship on those principles so that we don't have these recycling problems that go around and around and around? And she said, no. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, why? And uh, I was shocked, actually. I mean, it was such a, I thought it was such a great idea. And because uh, all you got to do is be honest, take responsibility for what's going on, and dedicate yourself to your creativity. Simple, right? And uh, so um, I was so shocked that, that she said, I said, why? And basically, God bless her, she said, 
that she would really only want to be in a relationship with me if I agreed that she was right all the time. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, you know, there's something fundamentally wrong with that uh, approach to life. So anyway, fortunately, we went our separate ways. But I also, in one of those moments, I said something to the universe. I said, maybe it's not in the cards for me to have the kind of relationship I'm talking about. And if so, if there's some reason why I shouldn't have that, okay. But I promise you this, I'll never again settle for less. Okay? So remember my little commitment when I was coming out of my ice experience there was, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that state of consciousness in myself all the time. And then this one is, I'm going to do whatever it takes to create the kind of relationship I want, and I'm not going to settle for less. Okay? Even if I have to be alone the rest of my life. Well, one month later, I went out to uh, Menlo Park, California to um, give a talk at um, a graduate school there called the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. And um, I, um, I started talking, and there was this one woman in the audience that thought everything I said was so funny. <laughs> and uh, I mean, she really got all my jokes. And uh, so uh, I began to pay more attention to her. <laughs> and, uh, and during the break, she came over to me. I wanted to meet her. I wanted to go find out who this magical person was. And um, so um, before I could go meet her, she came across the room to me. And it turned out she was uh, getting her PhD there and was also the movement therapy instructor there at the, uh, at the graduate school. And um, so um, and she and I were, I, I was about 34 at the time, and she was about 31. Um, so, and she was in private practice there in the Palo Alto area. So um, she had a name tag on, and it said Kathleen. And uh, so I said, hi, Kathleen. And before I could get my little thing out about, I wanted to ask you about something. Uh, she said, uh, I've got a question that I, what, and I said, do you mind, uh, I'd love to ask your, answer your question, but I just got to get this thing out of my throat because I have this commitment to being honest. And I said, I really was attracted to you when you were laughing and uh, you know, I re really uh, enjoyed connecting with you like that. And she sort of went, huh, okay, thank you. You know, because she'd come across to ask me some academic question and I came in at a whole different level. And by the way, to this day, we cannot remember what that question was, that she came over to ask me some technical question. And um, so I said, um, I want to tell you, I'd love to ask you out for a cup of coffee, um, but I also want to let you know that I just had this big epiphany where I realized that I mess up relationships by not being honest and then blaming and then not being dedicated to my creativity. And so I want a, a relationship, that's the kind of relationship I want. I want an honest relationship and one where both people take responsibility and where both people are dedicated to their creativity. And on those terms, would you like to go have coffee with me? And, um, <laughs> So what do I have to lose, right? I mean, uh, so I'd made this vow to the universe never to settle for less. And um, to her great credit, she took about 10 seconds in thinking about this and thinking over everything I said and said, yeah, that sounds great. And we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. Um, <clears throat> So that was a big leap for me. That was an equivalent big leap of that one up off of the ice into the journey of learning about yourself. Um, the, the leap that came, uh, that the big leap comes out of is something I, that dawned on me one afternoon in my office. I was feeling really good and I'd just come back from lunch with a colleague and we'd been talking about stuff we were really interested in and writing about and working on. So I was feeling kind of a, Hi, and uh, I came back to my office and I was feeling really good and I was kind of sitting there just kind of stretching my chair and all of a sudden I found myself rather obsessively worrying about my daughter who was um, uh, about six years old at the time and she had gone away to this three-day camp where she was going to be staying over 
uh, overnight for the first time. Okay, And she had already had the first night, and so on the second day was when this happened. I started worrying about her. And so I called over to the camp and said, uh, how's Amanda doing? And um, the uh, director was very nice. She said, well, she's doing great. Uh, seemed to have a great night, and I see you're out there in the field playing soccer with some other girls, and uh, so what can I do for you? And I said, oh, I was just worried about her. You know, I was kind of picturing her being lonely, and and, and the director chuckled and said, well, yeah, you know, this is about the third call of the sort I've received today and everything. So she was very kind about it. Later, I got to thinking, how did I get from feeling good to then click, worrying about my daughter? What were the mechanisms that would make that happen? Because I was feeling really good, and then the next moment I was bummed out. And then I had trouble kind of getting myself back to feeling good again. And I had this insight that really opened up a whole new line of work for me. And the insight was, I started worrying because I was feeling so good. That I had an upper limit thermostat setting on how good I could feel, and when I exceeded that, I would do something to mess myself up or bring myself back down. And so I started really studying that with people. In, um, in over a thousand sessions where that played some kind of role, I had the opportunity over the next 20 or 30 years to really study the mechanism by which people sabotage themselves and the way that you can free yourself up so that you don't keep banging up against those upper limits. So the book, The Big Leap, that I'll be out there signing in a little while, is about that process and how to spot the upper limit problem in yourself. There are basically four big fears that human beings carry around in us when it comes to being successful. And some of them will sound familiar to you probably. Many of us block our ultimate success because we have an old fear we picked up in childhood of outshining other people. We have a fear of outshining other people and it often comes from sibling interactions when you're growing up where you get the message, unconscious message, that don't shine too much because that'll make little Robbie feel bad. Or, you know, maybe if there's a family favorite and you're not it, you're getting the message of don't be too big because this one is the designated favorite. So there's a bunch of variations of that, but they're all based on a fear of outshining someone. A second fear, I just came across this yesterday in a person I was working with. We're doing a large training up in Ojai uh, this week, one of our advanced trainings where we have 50 or 60 people who come in from all over the world to work with us for five days. And um, one of the women was sharing this problem that comes up for her in relationship um, where she doesn't feel like she can get a word in edgewise with her husband and she you know, kind of gets confused in arguments and that kind of thing. What it came down to really was, I said, well, what is the actual feeling you're experiencing in your body right now? And she said, well, it's kind of like I'm a burden. And she said, it's like right now, I feel like I'm taking up time that somebody else should have. And that my existence is a burden on you, and this is bothering you. You'd rather be talking to someone else. Well, these are exactly the kinds of feelings that went back to day one for her because the way she was conceived and born she was a burden and was given that message unconsciously. Later on in life as she gets to be more successful she runs up against this because she says you know why should I finish my PhD? Do the world really need another PhD? Isn't that just another burden on the world? You know there's already 60 million PhD dissertations so she feels like she's a burden. So that's a second one. The third fear that blocks our upward rising into our zone of genius is the fear that if we go to our ultimate level of success, it will be disloyal to and leave behind people that were there for us earlier in our life, perhaps in our family or friends and someone that you're afraid of leaving behind. So it's an issue of loyalty that you kind of keep yourself down so people that won't feel, you won't have to leave them behind. Um, the fourth one is probably the most pervasive, and that is that many of us carry around a fear that we're some way fundamentally flawed, that in some way we're wrong or um, there's something wrong with us, and that uh, if we get to be more successful, somebody will discover that. 
and that the more successful I get, the more likely it is somebody will spot my fundamental flaw. These are all what I call imaginary crimes because you got convicted if you have the burden one, for example. She got convicted of being a burden and it wasn't her crime. It wasn't something that she had done. So all of them are imaginary crimes. As you get up into your 30s and 40s and 50s, it becomes incredibly important to spot yourself when you're upper limiting yourself, when you're bringing yourself down, when you're sabotaging yourself, when you're worrying too much, when you're arguing with your partner in such a way that it keeps you um, burning up the energy that you could be used for your creative endeavors. So as you get up into your 30s, 40s, and 50s, it becomes really imperative that you spot when you're upper limiting yourself and move through that so that you can live in this place I call the zone of genius. If you break down your activities in a given day into what you did all day, you'll find typically that your activities sort themselves into four types of activities. I don't know why we've got fours going here tonight, but there's four fears and four of this. Um, but um, there are largely four activity baskets that your activities will sort themselves into. You're either in your zone of competence, where you're doing things that you're good at, but somebody else could do them just as well. Or sometimes you're in your zone of incompetence, where you're doing things that you're not very good at, that somebody else could do better than you, but you persist in doing them because you, can't, you don't think you can afford to uh, have them done by somebody else, or you don't think there's a other person that could do them. So that's your zone of incompetence. Where a lot of us folks get really trapped, though, is in our zone of excellence, the third zone. That's the zone where you're doing things today that you're really good at, that you perhaps do better than other people, that make you plenty of money, for example, or, or you get a lot of good feedback. So that's your zone of excellence. And while it sounds like a good thing on the surface, most of us spend too much time there such that we don't get into that zone of genius. The zone of excellence is very seductive in a way because by the time you're you know, at that level, you're making plenty of money doing it, or you're indispensable to your family or your organization, and you're, the trap for you is that if you stay in that zone of excellence, you don't spend the time in your zone of genius, which is your ultimate calling. Your zone of genius is when you're doing what you most love to do, what you're uniquely suited to do, the thing that you can do that hardly anybody else can in your given family or organization. Your zone of genius is when you are doing things that even a small amount of them have very big results. So that I've worked with 800 executives, business executives over the years when I used to do a lot of executive coaching. And one thing I've heard from so many of them, they would say something along these lines, man, if I only could just sit and think for 10 minutes quietly without anybody bothering me. I would be able to get immense more things done. You know, and so, you know, one of our parts of our program is a formal 10 minute creative expression time every day. So they would really thrive when I started having them do that because it was something that just spoke right to their soul. So your zone of genius are made up of those things that you are uniquely suited to do, that you love to do, and that even if you do a relatively small amount of them, they have very large results. Another way to tell when you're in your zone of genius is you enter the timeless. You're not in touch with the usual type of time constraints. And you might look up and somebody says, it's time to eat, and you go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I realize I am hungry. I have that experience all the time. You know, my wife comes in and she will stand there. She's a magnificent chef in addition to the 148,000 other great things she's good at. And uh, she'll, uh, she'll be standing there and then I'll realize I've been in a trance for four hours writing, you know, and I'm starving, you know, but I didn't even think about it till I felt the wafts of uh, the food. So um, you enter the timeless when you're opening up to your genius. So those are some good ways to um, tell when you're operating in your zone of genius. As far as organizing time, when I first figured this out, I started mapping out my day and I realized I was spending about 10% of my time in my zone of genius. 
and 90% of my time doing other stuff. Over the years, I gradually worked my way up to where I was doing 50% of my time in my zone of genius. And now it's about 70% of my time in my zone of genius or getting around from place to place to do what I do. I wouldn't say being on the freeway this afternoon was my genius self, but it was what I needed to do to, uh, to get here this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to pause and um, take a little sip of water here and... Um, uh, we will open up the floor for uh, Q&A or your observations, anything? Yes, sir. Um, you said the first one was a zone of... Sorry, the other one, sorry. Wow, this is a 7-up or, or, or something like that. Can I trade it for some water? Yeah. You don't want me to start hallucinating up here or anything like that. <laughs> Sugar's a hard drug for some of us. Uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I took this swig of what I thought was water just as you started talking, and my brain cells went, you know. <laughs> water right here. Thank you very much. Hi again. Uh, you said in your four big fears, the first one said, you said the fear of outshining. Outshining. And the third one said the fear of leaving someone behind. They, they seem like cousins or something. They are cousins. Okay. Yeah, they, they, uh, many of them are sort of inter interrelated. And one person might have two of those four, and another person might have one of those four. Very rarely does somebody have three or four of all of those. Um, well, the fear of outshining often is in reference to one person. Um, you know, like, don't outshine your brother Billy. You know, it's that kind of a thing. It's often more specific, whereas the, the disloyalty and abandonment is often to a, a family or a class of people or something like that that you've gone beyond. With you becoming successful at such an early stage of life, you've probably actually gone through um, some of those in one way or the other. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so I'll go for. The, so, what's the coaching to get beyond these fears? So, if you have a fear of uh, disloyalty or leaving behind, yes. And actually, let me, let me share it. It's, uh, my own uh, sixth grade, no ninth grade, seventh grade. <clears throat> you go around and you get a report card all day long and then come back in uh, homeroom at the end and I'm sitting there and I got straight A's and like somebody says hey this guy got straight A's and so every, so all these people come over and look at are looking at my report card like like who are you like what like what planet are you from and I didn't experience it that way I thought I'd just like gone through school you know or did so it was it was uh, a real feeling of disconnection. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of moments I'm talking about. And so, so what, the hell with them? Leave them behind? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, let, me, let me give you a, a couple of the kind of the hot tips from the book. The, what I recommend, um, and there's a lot more detail in it, but one of the chapters is there in it is something I call the ultimate or universal success mantra. It's a, a, a thought that I recommend that people uh, float through their consciousness. The gist of it is um, that I expand in love, abundance, and creativity every day as I inspire other people to do the same. And so it's a, it's a concept that I started using with uh, business executives many years ago, and we kept refining it and refining it. And so one thing you can do is circulate a new affirmation or whatever you want to call them. Um, the, uh, the basic idea, though, is that you're floating a new idea through your consciousness a number of times until you kind of, um, until it gets a grip on you. So that's one of the things I recommend. Another great Another thing that I'm really big on is spotting these things as they occur. So catching yourself, upper limiting yourself in some way. Catching yourself 
starting an argument with somebody right after a period of being close to them or catching yourself worrying right after a period of feeling good. And one of the best things that I ever learned that I've taught to thousands of people now, I even wrote a whole book about it, is Fritz Perls. Do you remember him? He was the founder of Gestalt Therapy. Um, he, um, he passed away in 1970, but I had the great privilege of getting some mentoring from him. And one of the things he used to say was fear is only excitement without the breath. And I've used that quote in a couple of my books. It's so apt. If you think about what he's really saying, he's saying that the very same mechanisms that produce fear produce excitement if you remember to breathe with it. And so you can actually prove that to yourself next time you get um, anxious about something. I actually used it today in the dental chair because um, I don't like to use anesthetics, you know, Novocaine. And so I use my breathing, you know, and the louder the drill gets, <sighs> the bigger my breath gets. And so um, I find that if I stay right on the edge of the pain with participating with my breath fully, that it doesn't actually turn into pain. It's kind of a, seems like a far away pain, but it's not the kind of sharp pain that you would expect. Um, so... Um, that's just one example, though, but next time you catch, you're walking down the street and you notice some anxiety and you're thinking some worry thoughts, take a few easy, big, deep breaths and just feel that fear turn into excitement. It's a very magical, alchemical process that happens literally right under your nose. And uh, scientific research actually tells us that you can begin to change your um, blood chemistry within three centered breaths. In other words, three, three easygoing breaths. I was still a university professor at the University of Colorado when I wrote my book, Conscious Breathing. And I caught so much flack from other faculty members, you know, when they heard that I was writing an entire book about breathing, you know. And I would get ribbed at faculty senate meetings about... What's the first chapter? Breathing in, and then chapter two is breathing out, how to breathe in. And, um, but now, um, there have been over 3,000 scientific studies on the therapeutic use of breathing. And so, um, I'm uh, very pleased to have had the last laugh there. Yes, sir. Question. Do most of these negative trends, they're implanted when you're really young, let's say between a certain age? Well, many of them seep into our system during the prenatal time. A surprisingly large number of them do just because of what's going on around you and the vibrational field around you. Um, an another set of them are imprinted in the birth process by the way people are born sometimes puts a template in their body that life has to be about struggle. And so uh, for many people that starts at our birth. Uh, there are key developmental stages, like during the first year of life, when our oral machinery is developing, we're learning to eat and suck and that kind of thing. There, if there are disturbances going on around you then, that's another key time that you can kind of lock those things into your body. Uh, so there are different developmental stages that where you're more likely to have particular issues get a grip on you. Um, most of the things that keep us upper limited already were in our heads when we put on our yellow slicker and picked up that little lunch box and walked off to the first grade. You know, there were already a lot of imprints in there that would later come up to trip us up when we're later in life and getting to be more successful. And there are great examples of upper limits flameouts throughout history, particularly we've had a very rich time over the past 50 years of very public upper limit problems, you know, like Bill Clinton, when he was 26 years old, was taking a tour of the White House and said, I'm going to live here someday. And he did. But then an old pre-adolescent sexual issue, you know, being sneaky about sexuality, which most of us were when we were adolescents or pre-adolescents. And yet, but most of us had kind of figured out some of the rules about that. But not Bill, not Bill. <laughs> Got to do it in the Oval Office, you know? Um, but the, um, the papers and the internet news sites are full of all sorts of people that get to a certain place and then they 
dial up one of their upper limit issues and it just takes them down. Yes, there you go. How do you help people discover their uh, zone of genius? One question, probably the first question I ask is, what is it above all that you most love to do? Because if you will trace back through time what you most love to do, you'll find oftentimes that it was very close to something you loved to do even before you went to school. I tell the story in the book uh, of, I don't actually remember this, it's a family story about me, I remember it vaguely, but it was told about me so many thousands of times at family dinners and stuff that I have a pretty good memory. When I was four years old, I got a tricycle, and it was a rainy day, and um, so I couldn't ride outdoors. It was the first time I'd ever had a tricycle. And so my grandmother gave me permission to ride it around her living room. And um, so I set up a cardboard box in the corner of the room, and I got my grand granddad to write on the box, Problems. And I sat in my cardboard box, and that was my office, and people were supposed to come and talk to me about their problems. Okay? So that was how I spent my fourth birthday, was in my office. Uh, nobody ever came to me from my family to talk to me about their problems, but I was open for business anyway. And uh, so I would uh, commute to my office on my tricycle, and I would park it, and I would sit there in my box for a while, and then I'd commute back. And uh, so uh, that was me at four years old. So... Is this fundamentally different? No, you know, it's basically, you know, I came in an infinity today, but uh, other than that, it's basically the same process, you know, helping people work out whatever issues they have. And uh, when I'm doing that sort of thing, you know, I, I'm doing it here. Yesterday I was doing it with one of our advanced trainings. Last year I was doing it on Oprah a couple of times. The year before that I was doing it, I took uh, six months off, I was doing it in the outback of uh, you know, riding around buses in the back of nowhere. Uh, but uh, whether I'm sitting next to somebody at a, um, on an airplane or here talking to you, I always like to talk about the same thing, which is how can we unlimit our true potential. So one way to do it is to really ask yourself, am I doing what I love to do? And ask yourself, how could I spend more of my time in my working life doing things that I love to do? I bet each one of you, if you really think about it, will find that there are these certain things that you do that are the things that you love to do. So you've got to start doing more of them. And that way your life becomes an expanding wave of miracles done out of love. Stunned into silence. <laughs> Pounded by the metaphysical sledgehammer of Gay Hendrix. Yes. I'm of that generation when uh, a child was conceived out of wedlock, the parents had to get married. And I know I have so many friends who are first children like I am who were conceived in the backseat of something. I'm not even sure if it was a car, but I, I know that, pre, you know, prenatal that this was, I was coming into the world as a burden. Yeah. And when my, uh, I, my mother and father got married and my father didn't even live with my mother for two months and my grandmother found out they were married and she said, you go live with your wife. So I think I had two parents like that. I yeah. Mean, do you come across this a lot in your practice? With, I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean, I, I have a story similar, somewhat similar to that in the sense that I was conceived um, very accidentally, um, and then my father died several weeks later, and so I never actually knew my father, and my mother was in the middle of this big grief process the whole time, and uh, actually started out weighing 120 pounds, and by the time I was born, it weighed 89 pounds, and they think that's what reset my thermostat that made me fat when I was a child, because I the 320 pounds I told you about when I was 24, I'd been obese when I was a child. Also, so it was a problem that had been around for a long time, and um, I didn't ever really ever get it healed uh, by doing anything medical. But what I did was, after I had that pure consciousness experience on the ice, I um, I lost 100 pounds in a year with a very radical diet, and I'll give it to you free of charge tonight. I ate only things that fed my spirit. Before I would eat something, I would think, is this going to feed pure consciousness or is it going to feed my 320-pound body? 
And sometimes lunch for me would be half a cup of blueberries, you know, but it was the only thing I could find to feed my uh, spirit. And gradually I began to have a taste for foods that fed my spirit, and there went the weight. Um, and so um, I highly recommend that we organize all of our lives out of what will feed my spirit, not just the foods we eat. Yes, do you have a question? Oh, okay. Well, I'm happy to continue dialoguing with you, but what the heck. Uh, so does uh, everybody have a zone of genius? Yes. Short dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have not met anyone yet that, that doesn't. Uh, yes, in the back with her hand up. I think that I love my zone of genius. I think I go into it and write and create and do wonderful things. But I don't know how to get out of it and interface with the world the way I used to do. In the recession time and on the last couple years, I will go inside and lose time and space and um, create, but I don't know how to um, bring it out in the world. Is that, where is that mixed up? In the fears or the well, upper limits? Yes. Um, well, my first thought about it is that it's probably a calling. If it's not feeling right or you're not feeling you know how to come out into the world, I've found it best not to effort in that direction, but to actually go deeper into your creative process and expand into that further and then catch a wave that comes out where it's effortless, but not to effort, effort, effort at it. Another question. Um, you were talking about children and the effect that uh, childhood trauma may have on the adult. What advice might you have for educators to support children so that they can get there much faster at a younger age? Yeah, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, well, one thing that I highly recommend in, and have contributed to in, in various ways um, is I would like to see a lot more useful um, psychological and relationship skills taught at an early age. Like I've uh, contributed to uh, curriculum materials on how to teach children how to listen, which is a key skill in life. But how much training do we ever get in how to listen? You know, I never got 10 minutes training of that in elementary school or high school or anything like that. It wasn't until I got to graduate school in counseling psychology that I finally had some formal training. And it's actually not that difficult to learn how to listen. It's just a whole new kind of a technology. It's like learning to drive a car. Uh, so um, things like how to solve a problem without making somebody wrong. Uh, that's a powerful thing that could have a huge impact in the world. And where do we ever get trained in how to do that? You know, there are lots of us in this room that have not figured out how to do that yet. And uh, we're the cream of the crop. So uh, I... Um, I support a number of organizations that are trying to get materials on emotional intelligence and things like that out into um, elementary schools so that we can teach these things to people so they won't have to. The way I put it is, <clears throat> do you remember how much time you spent um, memorizing the state capitals when you were in elementary school? Remember how laborious a task that was, you know? And um, I can remember my granddad sitting there kind of going over them with me and I kept always messing up uh, there were a couple of them that I would reliably mess up. There was Helena, which was Montana. That took me a long time to get. But here's the thing. Nobody in my entire life has ever come up to me and said, Hey, bud, what's the capital of Montana? Yeah. It has never happened. We spent hours and hours doing that. And just think if we spent those same amount of hours 
learning how to communicate with each other, you know, to actually have some formal training in it. So I'm a big cheerleader for that. I would love to hear you talk uh, from your mouth about your theories about time. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of how I would do it without my mouth. Let's see. Uh, <coughs> but <clears throat> um, There's a chapter in the book which I would love you all to read and pass along the wisdom of uh, in case you didn't uh, bring your 20 bucks tonight or whatever the book costs. Let me give you a, a key punchline from it. It's called Einstein time. And there are two basic life positions toward time. One of them is very unpopular and one of them is very popular. The, unpop I mean, the popular one happens to be wrong. Like a lot of popular things. But the popular conception of time is that it's out there. And it has a force on us. There is such a thing as pressure, time pressure. Okay? And that's complete malarkey. There is no such thing. That if you take an Einsteinian approach to time, you go to the opposite extreme and you say, time is not out there. I own time. I'm where time comes from. And from that position, you become the master of time eventually, because then circumstances bend to make the amount of time available to do what you want to do. And so the kind of the key punchline of Einstein time is that, again, if you're doing what you love to do, you enter the timeless, where you're, you're in the right place at the right time. And um, I had this wonderful experience when I was first figuring this out. I was rushing one day from one end of the other to the, I think it was the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, you know, that huge airport down there. And I was going along there and, uh, you know, very stressed out, trying to get to my plane because my other plane had been late. And so I looked up on the um, thing and it said, it was um, boarding. And so then I really started hurrying. And I realized I was really stressing out my body. And so I just paused there in the middle of the concourse. And I said, Einstein time. Time to apply Einstein time. Instead of feeling like I'm in a hurry, let me just walk at a pace that feels good. And so I did. I just started walking at a pace that felt good. And I got down to the... Um, podium, and they were just closing the door of the airplane. And I, and I so walked up to the podium. There was a guy in front of me, one customer, and he was enraged. And he was beating on the counter, and he was saying, I must board that flight. I am Humphrey T. Norton III, and I must get to Washington. And um, the poor beleaguered, um, you know, clerk was saying, I'm sorry, you know, the plane is full, the, there's no more seats, but I had a reservation. You know? So anyway, he was raving, raving, and um, so he stormed off down the um, concourse, still yelling, I'm going to sue, I'm going to own United Airlines, I think he said. Um, and um, so I stepped up into first place there, and the, the clerk was still looking down, and um, I said something like, Boy, one of those days, huh? And the guy sort of looked up, and uh, I had a you know, smile on my face, and I sort of gestured toward the, that guy, and uh, you know, he was, sort of shrugged his shoulders like that, and I said, it sounds like uh, I'm late, and I missed the flight. And he said, yeah, unfortunately. Just then the door opens, the jet door, and a flight attendant comes bustling out, and she has this whispered conversation with the uh, clerk. And I hear the word miscount. I'm now all ears. And so the clerk said, uh, we miscounted. We actually have a seat. And he looked up the concourse to where Humphrey T. Norton III was storming off. And I saw him go, would you like a seat? You know? And uh, so uh, it's in, it turned out it was in first class, too, which uh, was really nice. Um, so an example of Einstein time pausing to savor the quality of life instead of being pulled along as if time is an actual pressure or force. 
being in the right place at the right time than for miraculous circumstances to unfold. So that's sort of what Einstein time is, is all about. That's the product of it. But I encourage you to read the details in the book because it's very, very juicy and it'll change your life. <laughs> all right. I would like to call on this young lady here with her hand up. How do you make every moment an expression of genius? How to make every moment an expression of genius. At the beginning of it all, down inside, to make that happen, you need to make a commitment to your genius. All powerful journeys begin with a moment of commitment. And you can make your commitment here tonight, and it's a commitment to expanding every day in your genius, to finding out what your genius is and expanding into it every day. And as you do that, circumstances unfold, just like my magic first class airplane ticket. Circumstances unfolded to support what I wanted to have happen there. And I promise you that it will. I've never seen it not work that way. Uh, it's almost like um, uh, if I back when I was a much more of a left brain person, if I, anybody had told me that I'd be living the kind of life I'm living now, I would have thought they were insane. You know, but now I look back at that old version of myself that was very pressured and, you know, always in a hurry and weighed 300 pounds and all that kind of stuff. And that one's the one that looks kind of crazy to me now. Okay, one more and then we'll call it a night. So, Gay, okay, who uh, has, would you say, has been the most influential in your life in terms of teachers, mentors, and, and what teachings do you feel have influenced you the most in bringing you where you are? Well, I probably wouldn't be here without um, a bunch of wonderful people, but one of them that jumps into my mind is uh, Krishnamurti. Uh, I started attending his lectures in the early 70s, and he really um, showed me how life could be an unfolding adventure of learning. You know, that if you committed yourself to the right things, life would just constantly surprise you with one amazing thing after the other. And he also guided me in one particular area with regard to this blame thing that I was talking about. Uh, he said um, that you could forget therapy, you forgive all that stuff if you under, understood one thing about transformation. And so we said, what's that one thing? And he said, well, it is that your results will always tell you what your intentions are. Mm. That if something happens several times in the same way that you don't like, it's because you have an unconscious intention for it to happen. And your job is to find out why you might be unconsciously intending something like that. <laughs> Having fun with cell phones over there? <laughs> okay. Thought maybe a video game was going on over there. <laughs> All right, well, I am going to uh, retire over there to the book signing area, and I brought my good book signing pen, um, and uh, come over there for more questions and answers or anything else I can do for you. And uh, would you like to say something here and, uh, as I close up? I see you're well, leaping to your feet. We want to thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.